Hi, it's Andy Hoffman again, Media Director for Miles Franklin Precious Metals. Today I'm privileged to have Jay Taylor as a guest. A fellow New Yorker, Jay and I have much in common. He was one of the so-called old-timers of the precious metal business, having written his first newsletter as far back as 1981. Like myself, he worked on Wall Street as well as in the mining industry, where he has become a preeminent global expert. Jay not only publishes the Gold, Energy, and Tech Stock newsletter, but hosts a weekly web-based radio show called Turning Hard Times into Good Times, on which I have recently made several appearances. When I first invested in precious metals in 2002, Jay was already well regarded in the space, and thus I'm thrilled to have him on the Miles Franklin audio blog. Jay, how are you? Well, I'm really good, Andy, and it's really great to be with you. Same here. After all these years, it's nice that we're having uh, this regular dialogue. Uh, so anyway, for the audience, first we'll start with this week's top news stories, and then we'll get a little more philosophical. Uh, I have to start with, of course, the, uh, the economic data um, following last week's, quote, better than expected NFP payroll report, which was predicated on a near record plunge in the labor t- participation rate to a 35-year low. We saw a spate of terrible ec- economic news worldwide. Uh, you know, first we had Europe where in the third quarter GDP came in at 0.1% this week, down from 0.3% in the second quarter, uh, and thus validating the ECB's decision to cut its benchmark rate to a quarter percent last week. Jay, what do you think is going on in Europe? Do you think they are worse off than America, the same, or or better off? <laughs> well, I, I think they're... Uh... I think they're probably a little worse off, Andy. You know, I, I just came back from Portugal. My wife is from Portugal. They uh, live in a very nice uh, town, a resort town called Cascais. It's about 30 kilometers uh, west of, of uh, Lisbon. Uh, and there's there's still money going in there because it's a little bit like New York. You know, foreign money comes in because it's a bit... So there's there's wealthy people from Europe and Africa and places go in there. But if you get a few blocks away from the main part of town, you realize that even that nice town called Keshkais is in sort of a depression. My mother-in-law has uh, a couple of rental units. Uh, She used to get, she used to get about 400 euros for a small apartment. Now she can't get it rented at 300 euros. The prices in the apartments are falling people's incomes are, are collapsing to a great extent. There's a lot of layoffs, uh, government layoffs, there's some. People are being forced to retire early. Uh, and uh, and, and in gen- just gen- in general, people don't have money, so they're doubling up and they're, you know, we're seeing it in the rental space at least. I think uh, Spain and Portugal and parts of Europe, Southern Europe, are frankly in a depression. And I guess you could say the same thing, Andy, you know, if you get out of the money center areas of the of the United States, the same thing is true here. But in answer to your question, I think uh, probably they're a little worse off. I mean, they're further down the socialist road, which is the road to poverty, than we are. But we're not much far. We're not we're not too far behind, as you know. Yeah, you mentioned, and you're talking about Portugal, which is one of the pigs, of course. But these kind of mm-hmm. things are also going on in you know so-called uh, first world countries like France. Uh, you, mentioned, right. you mentioned doubling up. Uh, you have that record youth unemployment throughout Europe, uh, which is why you're seeing uh, you're seeing car sales plummet, and uh, and you know rentals are going down because people are staying at home. So, uh, exactly. In my view, especially because Europe does not have the reserve currency of the world, they're in far more dire shape. And you know, this mm-hmm. week we saw them talking about uh, the potential for QE as opposed to the Fed's swap agreements, which are giving them covert QE. And I, I believe mm-hmm. that they're going to announce it sometime soon. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I, I would, Andy. And I saw somewhere today that it, it looks as though that's exactly what's happening. A, a lot of the liquidity that's being created here in the States may be uh, being made available to share with uh, with Europe, perhaps. Absolutely. Now, the even worse story, or better, I don't know how to put it, and I actually just wrote a piece this afternoon. It'll be out, uh, you know, probably Monday or Tuesday about Japan. Now, you know, as you know, they they engage in this qualitative quantitative easing when Shinzo Abe came into office last September, and since then they've gotten the uh, the the Nikkei to go up sixty percent. But the economy is terrible. They they uh, their inflation is up. Their real incomes are down, and they just announced this week that third quarter G 
uh, GDP with a negative price deflator was just 0.4% up from or down from 0.9% uh, last quarter. Now, what they are talking about right now in Japan is increasing QE as in not just doubling the money supply, but also spending money to buy stocks. Now, I think that this is the height of insanity. And, uh, you know, my question for you, Jay, is do you believe that that Japan is going to go down first or, or somehow are there demographics or something about them going to enable them to survive this before uh, this, you know, before the rest of the West and the world? I don't know. I think we're all in the same boat. I, I, I don't know, you know, who's going to get there first, the race to the bottom. But it cer certainly seems to me that Japan, you know, all the same policies everywhere. And this notion that you can just create money to create wealth and, and, and stimulate the economy, you know, it's it's really the, the height of insanity. It was, uh, I, I guess it's, uh, I, I guess um, it was Einstein that was credited with the, with the uh, definition of insanity, that if people continue to do the same thing over and over again and expect different results. Well, you know, it's, it, it isn't working in Japan. It's not working in the United States. All this quantitative easing, this money creating, asset purchases by the central banks are, you know, if anything, it's the Cantillon effect uh, that um, I've had um, some guests talk about on my show recently where the people closest to the money trough, you know, the, the, the bankers and the government officials enrich themselves at the expense of the real economy. And Andy, it's like parasites are eating away at the real economy. And when the real economy finally is utterly destroyed, what is there left even for these for these thieves uh, to, uh, to to have left to to enjoy? So I, you know, I think that Japan is, you know, probably with this with this guy, the president administration are just they're probably ushering in their demise more rapidly, even though it seems to them as though things are getting better. The parasites are being are, are being given more nutrition upon which to destroy the real economy more rapidly. Yeah, as, as Bill Holter would say, they, they've eaten through the muscle and the fat, and now they're eating into the marrow. Uh, and again, it's this 1% that benefits. And, you know, yeah, it's, it, it's less than 1% at this point. It's probably a half percent. And, you know, it's, it's just human nature to... To, to follow this and believe that somehow that this is going to work because, you know, we hope for things. But the fact is there have been 599 fiat currencies throughout history and not a one has survived. And yeah. uh, as far as I'm concerned, especially with the demographic uh, issues in Japan, it's hard to believe that they are that they are not going to be one of the first to go down the tubes. Of course, once yeah. they do, everyone does. Now, let, let's move on to the United States because most people want to hear about that. And of course, we know about last week's ridiculous NFP report. But this week, if you look at the data, every single piece of data that came out was terrible. Small business optimism, biggest drop in a year, Empire State Manufacturing uh, and uh, went negative when they thought it would be positive, Chicago Fed business activity, industrial production was negative today, jobless claims are up, international trade, the largest ever deficit with China, and of course, Janet Yellen calling for indefinite QE. <laughs> uh, at her at her confirmation hearing. Now, the 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 big issue with the United States is, I mean, I people know how I feel. Do you believe that QE can ever be stopped, let alone tapered? No, I don't. And uh, and I think all of the talk, you know, listening to mainstream folks constantly speculate on when the tapering is going to occur. I think there was one guy on Fast Money yesterday that I saw was suggesting it's never going to occur, but but most people believe it's got to occur. The response I get from a good colleague, friend of mine that's still in the banking industry in Manhattan, recently I was chatting with him, and he said, but Jay, they have to stop it. And I said, yeah, Jay. His name is Jay as well. I said, yeah, Jay, but they can't. And it, you, I mean, it just seems to me obvious, Andy, that they can't uh, stop it. And And I'm looking at something called the Global U.S. Dollar Liquidity index which um, Charlie Clow at Merrill Lynch created back in the with the Asian crisis and I'm watching this and I'm seeing it start to rise very very dramatically again uh, and you can see the distinct bubbles the the Asian crisis and then it was followed by the dot-com bubble then the housing bubble and then the bubble of all bubbles which was the transfer of wealth into the equity of, of the banking industry this measure fell back but now uh, we're back at a 31% growth 
global uh, growth of global U.S. dollar liquidity, which is really the measure of the uh, uh, the money that's at the um, uh, it, it, it's the money at the St. Louis Fed, as well as uh, dollars in in uh, foreign central bank accounts. So it's a mo it's a monetary base plus uh, foreign dollars overseas, and basically it is starting to rise very dramatically. So I'm starting to watch this very closely again. Each of these bubbles are bigger than the one before, which begets bigger problems, bigger debt, and then a bigger collapse. Yeah, it's almost... Followed, yeah, followed by another even more outrageous creation of fraudulent money. It's almost as if they've, they've created in their mind the fact that the stock market is now the sole measure of whether a program works. It doesn't yeah. matter. I mean, they've created, the Fed has created this 6.5% unemployment rate target, but we theoretically could get to 6.5% without a single job being created if the labor participation oh, yeah. rate uh, gets there. And if you're talking about Japan, where, uh, like the United States, there's an extremely low retail participation rate. So it's like, who are they benefiting by getting the stock market to go higher? Uh, you know, as soon as it is, and it's not even like it crashed, it simply hasn't gone up since it, it, it got to its high level uh, in June. And they're calling for more QE as yeah. if the stock market going higher is their sole purpose. Well, maybe it is. And uh, when it comes to, you know, Q, uh, tapering bonds, the Treasury now owns 33 uh, percent. The, the Fed now owns 33 percent of all the treasuries and 45 percent of all the mortgage bond securities. I mean, are they going to try to sell those? Of course not. There will be no buyers for them. So, yeah, I mean, I mean, that's that, I mean, that's the biggest question in my mind, Andy, and I'd like to hear what you have to say about this, because what what is I mean, the Fed can keep the interest rates low in theory, it would seem forever. They can continue to buy and buy everything and everything. But at some point, uh, what, it seems like there's going to be a, a loss of confidence and something's going to going to give and this thing is just going to go the other direction, isn't it? And Dramatically? Per, yeah, and, and who knows what that'll be. Perhaps yeah. it will be the physical gold tightness. I mean, we're seeing this week, I mean, since the, the Indian government, for instance, started with these ridiculous tariffs uh, mm -hmm. to try to stop gold, the premiums have surged. Uh, they're up to 22% over paper spot right now, which means people in wow. India are paying $1,600 an ounce for gold. Uh, yeah, and interesting. We, and we I wasn't saw, aware. Yeah, yeah, and we saw the COMEX today alone. In fact, this was this was last night. We lost 8% of the registered inventory. We're down to only, I think, 585,000 ounces, which is only <laughs> three quarters of a billion dollars in the registered category. So, you know, will it be the physical gold? I don't know. Could that be, Andy? That could very well be, you know, because what if, if you believe, as I do, that in fact uh, the manipulation, uh, the paper market play that's going on to to uh, to, to push down the real pr the, uh, the the quoted price of gold is is a manipulation aimed at conning people into you know remaining confident in the dollar. That in fact, if if all of a sudden something happens to these markets. Uh, and, and gold really starts to take off, that could really be the straw that breaks the camel's back, perhaps, overall in these markets. It would seem logical to me. Yeah, it's, I mean, the physical gold and silver are the Achilles heel of this whole game uh, of paper money, because all, all it would take would be the I would I would venture that if they took two days off, they said, let's take a vacation and uh, and count all of our winnings, and took two days off, they'd come back in two days, and gold would be $500 an ounce higher. That's my prediction. Because it yeah. takes such a, an, a gargantuan amount of suppression to mm -hmm. keep things down. And, you know, you, you see how the mining industry is doing right now. We're below the cost of production. Something's going to give on that front. Will it be the catalyst that starts the ball roll downhill? I don't know. But it will be something. And it very well mm -hmm. may be. Now, the, the issue I really wanted to explore with you on this, uh, on this audio blog was what's going on in the global stock markets. Now, just to give people a, a back you know, backdrop here, we are literally seeing global stock and bond markets soar amid these horrible economic conditions everywhere. Now, the poster child, as I've been writing about for some time, is Venezuela, where literally they are, they are having the equivalent of martial law right now. They're, you can't get milk or toilet paper. The CPI, which I'm sure is understated, is up 50% this year. The Bolivar has been devalued 200% in the last three years. And the Caracas Stock Exchange is up 500% this year, okay? Yeah. 
Now, and we, as you see, you see what's going on in the United States where the Dow literally is up every single day, 100 mm -hmm. points with no volatility at all. The, the, all the valuation metrics that we've seen in the past are being thrown out the window. And essentially every financial market has this horribly eerie correlation with the Fed's balance sheet. Now tell me, what do you think is going to happen with stock markets? Because can we have inflation and deflation? What's the difference between real and nominal returns? What do you think will happen in stock markets as this money printing continues? Well, it just seems, uh, it seems to me, Andy, that it's a one-way street, uh, one-way street upward for people that own stocks, uh, not gold mining stocks for sure, but almost everything else. And it's a one-way street to hell for people who are in the real economy, the honest, good work, you know, hardworking, good people that play by the rules and are honest and work hard and, and earn a living are getting screwed. And the people that are the thieves, that are the parasites, the guys that are on Wall Street and Washington are getting richer. And it seems clear to me that as Jimmy, you know, Jimmy Carter just recently said that America does not currently have a working democracy. Former President of the United States making that statement was never reported here, but Der Spiegel picked it up from a, con from a, uh, a speech that he made in Atlanta. It seems to me uh, that, you know, the people that are really running our country, uh, it's all about them. And I would guess that what we're, you know, Venezuela, maybe we're headed in that direction. I, I don't know. But it seems to me before we get to that point, there could be a lot of civil unrest and a lot of other issues that come into play. Um, it, it isn't a pretty picture, Andy. I wish it weren't so. You know, I wish we didn't have to own gold and silver and focus on those things. I wish that we could take our energies uh, to invest in things that are good for people. Exactly. But, uh, I mean, we don't we don't own gold and silver to, quote, make money. We own it to protect ourselves when everything else is losing value. Absolutely. And, and, uh, and it's hard to make yeah. that case right now because all of my yeah. friends that are in the regular stock market say, Taylor, you're crazy. You know, uh, you, you should be buying uh, you should buy the S&P. And, and, and you can't, it's hard to argue with that right now as long as it keeps going that way. Yeah, and they've, and they've created a housing bubble too. So people have gotten excited about housing. Although that's exactly. obvious, obviously that's cooling off as well. I mean, people forget that, uh, look, in Weimar, Germany, uh, the stock market soared, but when inflation took off, it consumed all of those gains. So they had major negative uh, real returns in the stock market. And right. the, only, the only thing that outperformed the cost of living were gold and silver. I mean, we've had 27, 27 uh, hyperinflations in the 20th century alone. And in most of them, I don't have the stats for all of them, the stock market did the exact same thing. That's what happened in uh, in, in Zimbabwe only five years ago. People... Uh, don't know what happened. The stock market went crazy, but it, you didn't make any money in the stock market because inflation was greater. And you right. know, you, now we're starting to see this happen on a global uh, basis. It's it's really scary to me because obviously, when when one thing happens, you know, it's going to be a chain reaction. So you know, the biggest question, Jay, we were going to go over is the difference between inflation and deflation. And I mm -hmm. know, obviously, it inflation by definition means money that's being created. Uh, deflation would be the opposite. But mm -hmm. how do you see the difference between inflation and deflation? Can we have both at the same time or must one dominate? I think we have both at the same time. We have both now. We have inflation and asset prices. Clearly, the money that's being created is going in to support the, uh, the privileged classes, as we just discussed. The equity prices are going up at the same time. Um, well, actually, food prices and energy prices, all those prices are also going up very rapidly as well. I don't think that we, you know, really truly have much deflation. I think we have deflationary pressures that are that are that are enormous. I think the um, the undertow in the economy is a massive deflation. If the Fed were to step away and stop creating money the way they are right now, I think there's no question you'd have a collapse in the probably starting in the stock market and then uh, ultimately in, in the bond market because there would be massive defaults. Uh, and you would have a deflation and a depression, the likes of which would make the 1930s look like child's play. Uh, so that's what I think is the normal. That's what the market wants to do. The market wants to, the global market wants to deflate and, and bring things back into equilibrium. Uh, and so that you can start anew with, uh, you, you know, with, with uh, uh, the right kind of the efficient allocation of capital and markets and so forth. They're not going to let it happen. At the same time, though, what it's doing is with prices rising and income shrinking, 
uh, the middle class is being utterly destroyed in America. Food stamps are reaching new highs. You mentioned the number of people in the labor force has hit new lows now. I mean, going all the way back, I don't know, to the 1970s, we're seeing the labor participation rate so low. So it, I think the underlying force is a massive deflation, which Bernanke and Yellen will be fighting tooth and nail to try to overcome. Um, and, and so I think there are deflationary forces. I mean, that def clearly, as I mentioned earlier in Portugal, there are deflationary forces in Southern Europe and different places, no doubt about it. Uh, but, you know, it's which way this thing goes, I think clearly uh, there's endless amounts of money can be created. It, the question is, does confidence, is there a loss of confidence in the markets that causes this a chain reaction to the downside that could lead to a horrendous deflation? Uh, I, I don't rule that out. I mean, yeah. 2008 was very close to it, Andy, and they caught it. They caught the, the falling knife and managed to keep it from falling further. But, um, you know, I, it's a mess, whichever way, whichever way this thing works out. Yeah. And I think people have to have to think about having food and water and gold and life's basic necessities, cash put away, uh, you know, not in a bank because God knows that they're they're already planning bail-ins for us. Uh, they know that the system is broke. The, the establishment knows the system is broke, but you can bet your bottom dollar mm -hmm. that there are probably some people at the very top of this, of this scam that are putting gold away in various parts, uh, uh, corners around the earth someplace for themselves. Yeah, the I mean, masses will be left yeah. high and dry, though. In, in 2008, of course, they had the ammunition to catch that falling knife. Uh, in the ability to print the trillions of dollars, and now yeah. they now they've done that, so there's nothing left, uh, and they'll keep trying, but you know ultimately it's going to end in hyperinflation. The way I look at uh, the whole inflation deflation thing is, is as I wrote a while ago, it's want versus need. The things that you need to live on are going up in price. The things right. that you want, which can include a house, you don't have to own a house, have yeah. been you know this pressure for them to go down, and the more that they print. Uh, you know, the more they'll be artificially inflated until ultimately the things that you want are going to come down in price. And then, of course, is the issue of exporting inflation. Us Americans are so secular that we don't realize that we, because we have the reserve currency, we don't experience inf inflation like the rest of the world. I mean, we talk about the fragile five uh, currencies this year where 25 percent of the world lived. They're down on average their currencies 30 uh, percent over the last two years. That is since mm -hmm. the Fed started its Operation Twist and QE3 mm -hmm. and 4. And that's why we've seen civil unrest in Brazil. We've seen the Egyptian coup, all these things going on in Turkey. So I truly believe that as the money printing picks up, you're going to see the periphery really start to feel it, and then it'll move up to the head at the end. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm afraid you're right. I, I, I fear that you're right. I mean, I think the worst yeah. of all worlds is a hyperinflation. I think a deflationary depression for people that have their finances in order is preferable. Uh, because, in fact, they could even be rewarded with more purchasing power. But that is not likely to happen, I'm afraid, longer term. And either way, the, the best way to protect yourself from either any of these scenarios is going to be to hold real money because uh, the currencies are going to be crashing against real items of value, particularly real money, uh, as this all goes on. Well, anyway, um, I thank you for having a, uh, I thank you for being on my show today, uh, Jay. Can you just give the audience a little background on, on how to get in touch with you or, or your various uh, websites or radio shows? Yeah, thank you, Andy. Yeah, the best place would be to go to J Taylor Media. That's J-A-Y-T-A-Y-L-O-R Media. And from there, you can go to uh, my miningstocks.com website, which has to do with my newsletter as well as a colleague of mine, Chen Lin, who's a brilliant investor, done extremely well. He sells a newsletter as well. And then my radio show you can access directly from Jay Taylor Media, and that's uh, live every Tuesday between 3 and 5. And Andy, thank you for coming on my show. Uh, you're one of the most popular guests we have on our show as well. Uh, but people can go there between 3 and 5 or download it from that site, uh, from the Voice America site, or you can down download my uh, radio shows, which have had a lot of really great guests. I mean, David Stockman's been on recently, Veron Paul. Uh, you know, Mark Faber, we've had Eric Sprott, lots and lots of people, uh, household name people that have been on the show. So people can go back and listen, download past podcasts uh, and listen to them. So uh, a lot of great guests. And I think it's something that a lot of your listeners would probably enjoy uh, listening to as well. So thank you, Andy, very much for having me on. Absolutely, Jay. We'll talk soon. Have a great weekend. You too.